So we are on to section 9.5, which begins on page 642. And these are hyperbolas. So again, you need to stay focused on how these are different from ellipses, not on how they're the same. Because if you focus on how they're the same, all you're going to see are the similarities and you're not going to be able to tell one from the other and you're going to get them mixed up. If you focus on how they're different, then you'll have an easier time keeping them straight, what you do on one, what you do on the other. Okay, so first of all, where hyperbolas come from, from our conic section, is if we now slice our conic straight up and down vertically, so parallel to the vertical axis, we're going to chop off a piece from the top cone and a piece from the bottom cone. It moves a little bit slowly, but it'll get there eventually. And then when it faces us, we'll see the blue parabola once it turns in our direction. So this is where we get the two branches of our hyperbola from. Okay, everybody can see the hyperbola? So that's a hyperbola. You have the piece going this way, you have the piece going this way. Okay, so that's where hyperbolas come from. As far as the definition goes, the definition of a hyperbola is the locus of points, and what does locus mean? The okay, collection. of points in a plane such that the difference of the distances from two fixed points to any point on the hyperbola or on the locus is a constant. This should sound extremely familiar. What does this almost sound the same as? Ellipse. There's one word that's really different. What word is it? What word is different? Difference. This is the word that's, di that's different. I gave you guys a hint. What was that word in the ellipse definition? Sum. Right? The two distances added up to the same number every time. It was the length of the string. Now, the difference between the two distances. If I take the big one minus the small one, it's always going to give us the same number. Okay? So, let's take a look at what this looks like when you actually construct one. So, here's my construction. Here is a focus, and I'm sorry, I should have mentioned that again, the fixed points are called the what? Foci. So, again, we have two foci. So, we have our two foci here. There's focus number one. There's focus number two. I have points marked D1 and D2. The length from D1 to my control point is distance 1. And its measurement is right here, 2.15 centimeters right now. The length from D2 to my control point is distance number 2, and right now it's 2.09 centimeters. Okay? The big one minus the small one is 0 0.05. Now what I'm actually doing, guys, because depending on where I move this, Sometimes distance one will be bigger, sometimes distance two will be bigger. We don't want that difference of distances to be negative, so I just have an absolute value on it. So we're just looking at how far, they, how much bigger the bigger one is, regardless of which one is the bigger one, because that really doesn't matter. So this absolute value is always going to make this positive. Notice as I drag this around, what's happening to all three numbers? The change. So if I put my control point here, distance one is my small one, less than a centimeter. Distance 2 is my big one, almost a little over 3 and a quarter centimeters. Notice my difference has changed. But for a hyperbola, that difference, 
these guys will change, but this difference has to always stay the same. Right now, as I slide my control point around, that distance or the difference is not staying the same. It's changing all over the place. Because of that, am I seeing any hyperbola show up up here? No, but watch what happens when I get outside of that. Now what happens is I start to actually get my hyperbola. What's happening is that now from here to here is distance one. From here to here is distance two. And when I subtract them, do you guys see what I'm getting? I'm getting the length of this line segment. How long is this line segment? 4.24 centimeters. No matter where I put this, the two distances change, but notice that the <coughs> difference does not change. It stays 4.24 because the long one minus the short one always gives me the length of this line segment as an answer. How do I get the other branch? I drag this to the other side. And so I only get hyperbola while that difference is not changing. And there we go. It's hard to get it to fill in perfectly, but that's all right. Any questions about that, guys? Now, how do you think we change the shape of the hyperbola? Change the line segment. Change what? The line segment. So you can change the line segment, the length of that segment that's left over. That's one way to do it. So if I make this line segment a little bit longer, and then I move this, now I get a skinnier hyperbola. What's another way to change it? Move the foci <laughs> relative to each other. If I take this focus and I move it closer. Sorry, I moved it too close, guys. Didn't mean to do that. Now it's going to widen up a little bit, right? If I move them farther apart, it'll get skinnier. Now, the issue is, guys, as you saw a moment ago, what happens if I move this too close? Well, now if I move this too close, I end up with an ellipse. The reason for that touches on something that I don't remember if I mentioned to you or not, but there's an idea in conic sections called eccentricity. And it's a measure of how far the, the, a circle has been stretched to get the shapes that you have, either an ellipse or a hyperbola. Um, and so with a circle, you have an eccentricity of zero. Eccentricity is equal to C divided by A, right? with the a, b, and c from the c squared equals a squared minus b squared equation. c remembers the distance from the center to the focus. Okay? And so the distance between the two foci is 2c. If I change that distance, then it affects my eccentricity and affects the shape that I have. But the type of shape can be affected if I change c too much. If I change c too much, then my eccentricity gets thrown into a whole different shape. Eccentricity of ellipses is between 0 and 1. Eccentricity of hyperbolas is larger than 1. And so what ends up happening is if I change the distance between my foci too greatly, now all of a sudden I throw it from one range of values into another range of values, and now it becomes a whole different shape. So that's the idea. All right. So any questions on basically where this stuff comes from? Let me put this back out here, make sure we're back to the hyperbola. And so the way this is actually being created is if I show you everything that's hidden right now, this is the construction that went into it. And so the distance here is the radius of this circle, and the distance here, distance 2, is the radius of this circle. And as long as I'm dragging my control point between the two points, Notice the circles change size, but they don't touch each other. When I go outside of that distance, now one shrinks down to zero and then starts growing again. And as soon as the two bump into each other, now I start drawing the hyperbola. So that's how I constructed these. That's crazy. I'm sorry? Well, because the radius of this circle is the distance from my point to D2. So as I get closer to D2, this sh it shrinks. When I'm on D2, it's nothing. And then when I go start growing on the other side, now all of a sudden it's going to start getting bigger again, right? Because I'm getting farther away from D2. So that's how you construct these. You guys remember in geometry doing compass and straight edge constructions? 
That's what Geometer Sketchpad does, is it allows you to do that on the computer. It's all compass and straight edge constructions, just in an automated form. Doing this by hand would be an absolute nightmare. But doing it on the computer is actually pretty nice, and you can actually animate it so that it does it on its own. All right, guys, questions about any of that? OK. So let's talk about our basics here. So we have a focus. We have another focus. We have a hyperbola. We have another hyperbola. Another branch, I should say, not another hyperbola. They're part of the same hyperbola. And so what's going on here, guys, is that this point here and this point here are going to be the vertices of our hyperbola. So we have a vertex and a vertex, just like ellipses. But remember, I want you to focus on the differences between hyperbolas and ellipses. The main difference, or the first difference that we're going to talk about is the fact that on an ellipse, we also had what besides vertices? Covertices. On hyperbolas, we don't have covertices because the hyperbola only touches the two vertices. There are no other two points that it touches going the other direction. What we do have on hyperbolas, however, that we don't have on ellipses is we actually have asymptotes. I didn't draw this very well, but I'll just sketch these in. So we have two asymptotes, and they go diagonally. Now, you guys have learned about hyperbolas in the last chapter. You guys learned about things like y equals 1 over x, which when you graphed it looked like this and this. And you had a vertical and a horizontal asymptote. Or if there was a negative in front of it, it looked like this and this. But they were diagonal to each other, the two branches, with vertical and horizontal asymptotes. Now we're going to turn that whole picture on its side a little bit. Okay? And now they're going to open either left and right or up and down. And the asymptotes are going to be diagonal. So you have an asymptote here. And you have an asymptote here. Right? That's the idea. What do you think we have right here where the two cross each other, the two asymptotes? It will be the origin for now, but it won't always be the origin. Depends on where this thing is. What do you think is going to be there? The, the what? Yeah, the center. That's going to be the center. That's going to be the center of our hyperbola. Okay? So hyperbolas have centers just like circles and ellipses have centers. Just like circles and ellipses, the center is not actually on the graph, is it? The graph, the curve, doesn't actually touch the center, just like circles, just like ellipses. Okay? Notice, though, guys, that the two branches of the hyperbola curve around their foci. Again, I told you earlier um, in the week, conic sections always curve around their foci. All right. So let's take a look at equations. So here are hyperbolas. You have hyperbolas that open this way and this way. You have hyperbolas that open this way and this way. These hyperbolas open in the x direction, and the equation looks like this. What does that almost look like? ellipse. What's the difference, though? Subtraction. The difference is the difference, right? It's subtraction instead of addition. So that's what makes these different than ellipses. Now, notice, where was my a squared? With which letter? X. Which way did this open? The x direction or the y direction? The x direction. So when a squared is with x, it opens in the x direction. So notice that was x squared minus y squared. This one is going to be y squared over a squared minus x squared over b squared equals 1. So notice that when y is with a, and so it's y squared coming first, and then minus x squared, notice that it opens in the y direction up and down. So now a is a function of which way it opens. It's not a function of being longer or shorter. And so one of the big differences between ellipses and hyperbolas is that with ellipses, what was true about a and b? A was always bigger than b. Good. That is not the case any longer. With hyperbolas, a is not 
necessarily necessarily is a big word. <laughs> wow, that's kind of scary, guys. So A is not necessarily larger than B. It could be, but it doesn't have to be. That has nothing to do with it. Now A indicates the direction that it's going to open. When A is with X, it opens in the X direction. When A is with Y, it opens in the Y direction. Sometimes A is bigger, sometimes A is smaller, sometimes A and B are the same. doesn't matter size-wise anymore. There's no relationship there. That's only for ellipses. Okay, let's look at an example. So what's our a squared here? Nine. Why is it nine? Well, not because it's with x squared, because remember, b can be with x squared over here. <coughs> a is always under the first term, guys, the positive one, the one that doesn't have a negative attached to the front of it. That's why it's a. So then... A squared is 9 makes A equal to 3. Which direction are we going to go 3 units in each way? X or Y? Y. Y, W, H, Y, I mean. <laughs> yeah, because it's underneath the X. What's our B squared on this one? 4. Not because it's smaller, because it's underneath the fraction that has a negative in front of it. So B is equal to 2. That's going to go in the Y direction because it's under Y. The question is, which way is this going to open? In the x direction or the y direction? X. How come? It has nothing to do with bigger. Because x squared comes first. x squared is that positive fraction. The y squared is part of the negative fraction. So it's going to open in this direction. So let's graph this thing. Now let me show you the differences in graphing it. So our center is at 0, 0. I'm going to put a little x. In the x direction, we're going to go 3 each way and put a point. In the y direction, we're going to go 2 each way and put a point. Looks like we're graphing a what so far? Ellipse, Ellipse right? right? Normally, we would now connect this with a curve, but this is not actually part of our hyperbola yet, guys. What these are, are these are guide points for what I call the guide box. You now draw a box that goes through those four points. Those are not the corners of the box. Those are the midpoints of the sides. And so what you draw is this. So you just very neatly make a nice rectangle that goes through those four points. Again, the points are not the corners. The points are the midpoints of the sides. Everybody with me? Very different than ellipses, right? Stay focused on the differences. That way you won't get them confused. The next thing that we do is we're going to draw the diagonals of that box from corner to corner. But I don't want to just draw the diagonal from corner to corner. What I need to do is I need to actually extend it way past the corners. And so the easiest way for me to do that here is to start at the middle and go up through that corner and then start at the middle and go down through that corner. Make sure you're going through the corners and through the center. If you have a nice long straight edge, this is easy to do. And it needs to be neatly drawn through the corners. Don't miss those corners, guys. I see students all the time draw them and they go like this. There's no way that's a diagonal, guys. That will be zero credit on the test. If you can't even hit the corners of your rectangle, then maybe we need to send you back to geometry. Okay. Those are the asymptotes. So this is one asymptote. This is the other asymptote. Easy enough so far? How long does that stuff take altogether? Yeah, a matter of seconds, right? You put those points on there, you draw the box, you draw the diagonal. Now we're ready to draw the hyperbola. Which way do we say the hyperbola is going to open, in the x direction or the y direction? Uh, are the asymptotes like x and y, or are they just like asymptote 1, asymptote 2? What do you mean, are they like x and y? The equation, yeah, we're going to have the equation in just a minute. Okay, guys, which way is this going to open? 
in the X direction. So what we do is we start right at this guide point, right on the box. You can't start off of the box or inside of it. It's got to touch the box. And it's got to open this way. Towards its asymptotes. The other one is going to start at this end of the box and it's going to open towards its asymptotes. Don't bump the asymptotes, but make sure you clearly show it going towards its asymptotes. There you go, guys. That's the graph. We're done graphing. No points to plug in. Just make sure you touch the guide point right on the box. Are you opening in the opens in the x direction because the a, it was x squared minus y squared as opposed to y squared minus x squared. Okay. Right. Okay. We're going to see one of those other ones in just a minute. Okay, any questions about the graph? We're not done because they're going to ask you for bits and pieces of information, but this is the graph. We're done graphing. So do you guys say that this graph is like two minutes tops? One to two minutes? They don't take long. And I'll show you how fast we can go through this whole thing in a minute. But let's talk about the things they're going to ask you for. One of the things they're going to ask you for is they're going to ask you for the vertices. So what are the coordinates of the vertices? Well, remember, the vertices are the two guide points that the hyperbola actually touched on the box. So what are they? 3, 0, and negative 3, 0. So we can just write it as plus or minus 3, 0 on this one. There are no covertices. There are foci, though. And going back to our picture here, remember that it curves around its foci. And just like ellipses, the distance from the center to a focus is C. The difference is, that on ellipses, it was c squared equals a squared minus b squared. Now it's a squared plus b squared. So on hyperbolas, where there's a minus here, then it's a squared plus b squared is equal to c squared here. It's actually the Pythagorean theorem. So let's find the foci. So first we have to find C. So C squared is going to be equal to A squared plus B squared. A squared is 9. B squared is 4. So now we get C is equal to the square root of 13, which doesn't simplify. So now we have to add and subtract that from one of our coordinates to get our foci. Remember, we start with what for the foci? What do we start with before we add and subtract this? Zero, zero. Why zero, zero? It's the center. Right? If our center was 3, negative 7, we would start with 3, negative 7. And then we would leave some room after each number. That's what's going to happen starting in the next section. So now the question is, do I add and subtract it from x or from y? Well, where are my foci going to go? In the x direction or the y direction? x. It has to be out here, and it has to be out here somewhere so that my curve goes around it. So where am I going to add and subtract square root of 13, the x-coordinate or the y-coordinate? x, because we have to move in the x-direction to get to them from the center. So we do plus or minus the square root of 13 right here. Now, do I really need this first 0 anymore? No. But again, it's there to hold the place because in the next section, you won't necessarily be starting at 0, 0. And so if you were starting at 3, negative 7, your foci would now be 3 plus or minus rad 13, comma negative 7. Everything starts from the center, and then you just add and subtract it from whatever the center coordinate is to get your foci. Any questions about the foci? Okay, the last thing we need to talk about on this, and then I'll do one more quick example, is the asymptotes. The asymptotes are always going to be of the form y equals plus or minus slope times x. The nice thing about, and I'm only ever going to ask you to do the asymptotes in this class when the center of the hyperbola is at 0, 0. When we're not at 0, 0, I won't ask you to do the asymptotes. They're, they're doable, but they're a little more complex. Here's the thing, guys. The nice thing about the center being 0, 0 is the asymptotes go through it. So we have two lines that have a y-intercept of 0. So this is just y equals plus or minus mx. b is 0. So there's no plus b anymore. Why is it plus or minus? Well, it turns out that both of these asymptotes have the same slope. They're both slanted the exact same amount, 
Just one of them has a positive slope. It goes up from left to right. The other one has a negative slope. It goes down from left to right. But they're both equally steep. So all I have to do is find the slope of one of them and then just make the other one negative. So what I recommend you do is start from the center and go to the upper right corner of the box. What is my rise going from the center to the upper right corner? How far up do I go? Two. How far to the right do I go? Three. So my asymptotes here are going to be y equals plus or minus two-thirds x. Those are my asymptotes. You see how easy they are to find? It's just y equals plus or minus slope times x. So that means that this one has a slope of two-thirds. The other one has a slope of negative two-thirds. Because if you look at the slope, you're going down two and to the right three. That's it. Any questions about any of those before I go over one more quick example? Is it always y equals plus minus? Always. <laughs> always. The only thing you have to fill in is the slope. Do not forget the y equals. Do not forget the plus or minus. Do not forget the x. If any of those things are missing, it's not right. Okay. Any other questions before we go over another one? Okay, let me show you how quickly we can run through this then. Let's do y squared over 4 this time minus x squared over 9 equals 1. What's my a squared this time? 4. Notice it's the smaller of the two numbers this time, isn't it? Because that has nothing to do with hyperbolas. That's only for ellipses where a is bigger. So a is equal to 2. Which direction is that going in? Good, the y direction. All right, b squared is 9, which makes b equal to 3, which goes in which direction? Which way is this going to open, x or y? y, because it's y squared minus x squared. So this is the direction it's going to open in. So let's graph it. So center, 0, 0. We're going to go 2 each way in the y direction. We're going to go three each way in the x direction. What do we draw next? The box. Good. Guide box. What do we draw next? Asymptotes. Center past the corner. Center out past the corner. Center out past the corner. Center out past the corner. Please use some kind of straight edge to help you out with this. Edge of your notebook, edge of your ID card, edge of your calculator, whatever. Now, which way do we say this is going to open? In the y direction, so it's going to start at the top and open outward towards its asymptote going up. And it's going to start at the bottom and open it outward towards its asymptote going down. We are now done with the graphing part, guys. How long did that take all together? Exactly 53 seconds. Very good. I'll buy that. Certainly two minutes or less, right, for that whole part? Probably more on the left side. Now, the vertices. What are the coordinates of the vertices? Zero, two, and zero, negative two. So we can just write it as zero plus or minus two if we want. What about the asymptotes? What's my rise and my run getting from here to here? Yeah. So it's 2 over 3, so again, it's going to be y equals plus or minus 2 thirds x, same as last time. Notice, guys, all I did was switch the x squared over 4, uh, x squared over 9 and y squared over 4. Do you see we got the same guide box? We got the same asymptotes? The only difference is which way this thing opened. Now, the foci are going to start out at 0, 0. c squared is equal to a squared plus b squared, which is now 4 plus 9 which is 13. So again, C is still the same thing. But now, where are my foci going? Left and right again or up and down? Up and down. So where do I add and subtract the square root of 13? From the Y coordinate. And then I don't need this 0 anymore. There you go. Same as the last one. The only difference is which way it opened, where the vertices were, where the foci were. Same guide box, same asymptotes. Any questions about how that works? So you see how that's a quick problem from start to finish? Yeah. Mitch? Are we going to improve this up a lot with line paper? Or paper? I would use graph paper. You could do it on line paper, but I would use graph paper, and I have some you can have. 
Okay, guys, any questions? Okay, homework assignment.